What is up, YouTube? We are back. The Sports Scoop. It is me, Dylan Shalom, and Serge Kadali, and we are going to be doing the Buster Boom series again. This one, the New York Jets. I've got Serge with me. He is a diehard Jets supporter. I'm a Dolphins fan. I'm going to not be biased. Let's see if Serge has a lot to say about his favorite team. Yeah, I'm really excited. I think, obviously, can't promise I'm not going to be um, not going to be biased, but I think. Obviously, I think many people can agree that the Jets had a very good offseason and definitely should be an improved team. But I've, as a De uh, Jets fan, like you said, I am very excited for this video. Yeah, uh, let's get into it. Y'all know how this works. <laughs> And for the first segment of the Buster Boom series, we are going to be doing key players. And for the New York Jets, we're going to have six players that we're going to talk about, three on the offensive side, three on the defensive side. And who else to start with other than the second year starting rookie quarterback out of BYU, Zach Wilson. Uh, I'll get into my thoughts after you do. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is a key year for Zach Wilson. I think, obviously, everyone can agree that it really wasn't an ideal rookie season for Zach Wilson. He threw uh, nine touchdowns along with 11 interceptions. His stats weren't necessarily, they weren't, they weren't good. They weren't good. And he threw for 2,334 yards and a 55.6% completion percentage. But when you think about it, even though his stats were very bad, it is so, and what so many people fail to realize is the context of the situation that he was in. He was one of the most pressured quarterbacks in, in all of football last year. He had next to zero weapons. I, I believe like a saw stat where his top three receivers, which I believe for the year were supposed to be Jameson Crowder, Corey Davis, and Elijah Moore were on the field together for a combined 12 snaps. I believe he had the worst deep ranked defense in the national football league. Cause of, again, the defense was also heavily injured and he really just, and he had a rookie coaching staff. He had a rookie head coach and he had a rookie offensive coordinator in a system that is very typically hard to um, kind of grasp. And Zach Wilson was never really seen as that kind of guy is going to step in and be that immediate great quarterback. He's uh, he's needs to be nurtured. He's a bit of a raw prospect and it really showed kind of in the early stages that he was one of the kind of, he was raw. He wasn't exactly ready for the NFL and he struggled early on, but we saw after he got injured I believe, against New England the first time, he came back and was much, much better uh, through down the stretch, nine touchdowns, two picks, including zero picks in his final five NFL games. So really, especially with the amount of more weapons and much more protect protection and even defensive support that he's going to get, there's no reason he shouldn't take a monumental sleep in a second year in a continuous situation. But um, definitely a crucial year for him. Definitely a crucial year for him to indeed. I want to just understand, I'll get into my analysis right after I bring up this point. How crucial is the second year for a quarterback? Because this season, the second year for a couple of quarterbacks, mm. we saw Joe Burrow make the Super Bowl. We saw Justin Herbert miss the playoff for the second time, but he's kind of a unicorn in a sort of that he's been on a bad team and he's been excellent. And then we saw Tua Tagovailoa and Justin, uh, not Justin, uh, Jalen Hurts, who were both not great but are still given a third chance. Would you say it's a two year uh, term for a quarterback or a three year term? If, if it, Zach Wilson it really, this season, it really it depends. I think if he shows up and shows no noticeable improvements and the jets are in a top five position, I think questions definitely have to be asked, especially considering the amount of help he's been putting put under. But if he puts up similar stats, let's say, for example, a two attack of Iloa or a Jalen hurts, especially with his upside, I don't see, any reasons why they couldn't go with him for a year to three, especially if they aren't in a position to get a premier quarterback next year. And another, another name that you really, that you didn't mention was Josh Allen. I'm not saying he's going to be Josh Allen. Don't, don't misinterpret that at all. But I'm just saying that the bills did stick with Josh Allen after a second year, after he put up bad stats as well. And I know, again, he's a unicorn. I'm not saying, I'm not saying he's going to be Josh Allen, but I'm saying what I'm saying is that the second year isn't the end all be all as some make it to be. I think it's a very important year and I think he should definitely show improvement. And if he doesn't, I'm not going to say, Oh yeah, well, he's the next Josh Allen. He should be, we should wait another year, but I think he shouldn't, he should show improvement. Definitely. But I don't think he needs to be in that Herbert or Burrow class immediately, but he definitely improvement is necessary. I didn't say he was Josh Allen. Cause I know that's what you're thinking. That is the one thing I'm emphasizing. So don't use that against me. Stop using Josh Allen 
I'm not saying. Stop, stop using I'm Josh. Not as, no, using, no, 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 no. I'm no, not let using me finish, him let me as finish, a just. Let me finish. No more. This goes to every fan that watches this video. We're going to post this everywhere because I want this to be seen. We are not using Josh Allen as a blueprint. That's not a blueprint. failing rookies in their second year. No, that, but that's what not, I'm, no, that's no, no, what, no, 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 no. That's I, not what I'm saying. But what I'm, I'm not, I'm, here's the thing. He should be better than Josh Allen was in his second year. Cause in the second year, Josh Allen was also, I mean, he was better. The team made the playoffs, but Josh he was still Allen led like, the team to the playoffs in the second year. He wasn't good, but he wasn't, wasn't good. He wasn't good. I think Zach Wilson has more weapons than Josh Allen did in his second year. And she, and obviously doesn't have the upside, at least physically, like his physical traits that Josh Allen did. So he should probably be better, but I'm, I'm using the Josh Allen example to kind of just show that a second year quarterback doesn't ne- won't necessarily take a Josh Allen level leap, but they w- can still improve from their second year to third year. It's not like they just go from first year to second year. And if they don't improve, it's like, Oh, that's their ceiling. That's it. They still have, no, no, I, I that's the point that. I was trying to make. I'm not trying I, to I, use Josh Allen's trajectory as an excuse for Zach Wilson to have another. No, I know. I know that's not what you're trying to do, but what it sounded like you were doing is saying, uh, what's it called? From second year to third year, he can make that Josh Allen leap because Josh Allen. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that just because second year is very crucial, but I'm saying that a lot of people seem to think that, oh, if they don't take that big year to year two leap, then that automatically means that they're a bust or they're not, they've reached their ceiling. And I'm just trying to say that and Zach Wilson isn't a Josh Allen, but he's still a very high potential quarterback. And I think he could definitely take a big year two to year three leap. Obviously, um, no one should put the Josh Allen expectation on him. He is an anomaly, clearly. But I think definitely he should show improvement. That's not just because he can make a big leap from year two to three doesn't mean he shouldn't make improvement year two. Because I think as we go into, obviously, the weapons that he's that he's going to have this year, it would be, frankly, a huge disappointment for him to not show any improvement. All right. Uh, now that we're past that stage, I'm going to give you my analysis on Zach Wilson. And if you're on our TikTok, you probably saw my Zach Wilson review. It was kind of brief because I had to do three other quarterbacks, uh, two other quarterbacks in the video. But overall, I think Zach Wilson's just volatile. I think he can be excellent, but I, I think there's way more downside that isn't talked about enough because of his last stretch in the end of the season where he was throwing the ball particularly short. And I know the weapons were uh, Jeff Smith's of what's of what's nots, but uh, there was a reason that he didn't throw any interceptions in those games. And it's because he did not try to throw the ball into tight windows in those games. He was very, very, very conservative. So we're getting that out of the way before we get into what I'm saying for uh, Zach Wilson is he's projected as that, sort of gunslinger Aaron Rodgers type guy that's how he was projected going into the into the league and when he tried doing that he just wasn't that he was bad he was really bad and he had one good game against Tennessee he got injured he came back and he worked as a conservative quarterback and he played better but he still wasn't that good now that's not to say that he won't take a leap because the situation as you were explaining was absolutely atrocious and I think now what they've done on especially on the offensive line now that it's healthy and now that they have Makai Becton back which is going to be massive that it's going to be better weapons as well. Garrett Wilson, we'll get into later. It's going to be massive for him to have those guys, but I think people sell short how horrible Zach Wilson was as a gunslinger, do it on your own type of guy. And it might be because of rookie coaching staff. It might be because he had nothing, but I just want to put this out there. Surface level, no little context to no context. Zach Wilson was a bad gunslinger. Um, well, yeah, I think definitely he wasn't good as a gunslinger. I think that's kind of, um, kind of like the obvious point, but I think at the same time, I think we saw definitely a lot of games where he had actually very good deep balls that were actually dropped. I remember specifically an opening day game against Tennessee, you know, not Tennessee, one of my saying Carolina. against Carolina, where he threw like a freaking like 50 yard bomb perfectly into Elijah Moore's hands which was dropped. And he also had a couple of, I think he had like a decent bit of, I think he was probably the quarterback who suffered the most from drops in the entire national football league. I know people say, Oh, well, every quarterback suffers from drops. Yeah. But they are not all on the same level. And I think definitely as a gunslinger, he wasn't, he wasn't very good, but I think at the same time, again, when you're such a raw quarterback, you're going to, and you're put in such a complex scheme as is the LaFleur scheme. It's just, 
you might it might not work immediately, especially when you don't have the tools necessarily to succeed in it. And I agree though that he wasn't ready for that, and it was probably it was the right decision to kind of get him familiarized with the quick game. But I think as one of the points that I really want to refute and is disagree is that Zach Wilson is just a gunslinger quarterback. He isn't a Matthew Stafford like quarterback. I think he is very. He isn't, again, another great quarterback I'm going to pair him to that I'm not saying he is at all, is Aaron Rodgers. He's in that mold where his amazing velocity on throws, like that arm talent is just indisputable. His amazing velocity on throws makes him kind of a great fit in the LaFleur kind of scheme because obviously Rodgers coached by Matt LaFleur. Jets have Mike LaFleur, his brother. And it's kind of built for that scheme where Rodgers, a lot of people don't like to talk about it. He's not necessarily even a gunslinger quarterback anymore. He's a quarterback that kind of thrives in that kind of short and intermediate game. But people think he's a gunslinger because he throws it deep and can throw it like 70, 80 yards a few times, which obviously he can. But he actually had less air yards than a lot of quarterbacks, such as Tom Brady, who many considers to be like a check down merchant. So I think really why Rodgers succeeds in that scheme is because he's very smart and he's got great velocity on those short to intermediate throws over the middle and outside the hashes. So I, anyway, I'm rambling on. We should probably move on from the segment. But I'm just saying is I think the system actually works pretty well for him. But I think he needs to obviously improve his footwork, which from what I've heard, it's improved. And he has to improve the mental side, which I think that's what coaches have really been raving about the most, that he really understands the playbook now. But I think that should be it for the se- segment. I think yeah, you got to move on. Him, but I'm just going to get in my final word. I'm not going to go crazy with anything i'm just gonna put out there i think josh uh wow uh, i think zach wilson is gonna have a better season this year oh definitely. but I, I put i put this out there to jets fans not to expect too much i, I was in the same situation last year with two attack of Iloa. i went out there and said two is gonna be amazing this year we're gonna go 11 and six and it, it didn't work out so regardless of what you think your organization did for him because i thought the dolphins were doing great by two i thought when they brought him will fuller when they uh well, well yeah but we get it we get it though that's yeah. pretty much all they did but uh I, I don't know why i thought they did great by him but uh <laughs> yeah yeah that didn't work out so well uh but year three uh zach wilson needs to brush up on a couple things he's thrown some dumb picks not great as a gunslinger well, not great terrible as a gunslinger and while he did reform his intermediate game i want to see him making those throws that you want from a number two overall pick before I can go and say that this team can compete for anything. So that's my final take on it. Let's move into the next key player on the offensive side of the ball. And that's Elijah Moore. Yeah. um, Sorry. (laughs) But yeah, no, I think Elijah Moore is definitely, he is another key part to this offense because we really saw him come onto his own during the um, kind of towards the, um, towards like the middle part of the season where before he got injured and was missed the final few weeks of the season, he was one of the, I think it was like from week eight to week 13, he was like leading a num a multitude of stats in um, receiving categories. And he was very, very good. And I think he's kind of one of those receivers that kind of f- falls under the radar. I mean, not on jet, not for jets fans, of course, but for like the NFL fans in general, because there was how good this receiver class was. Obviously you got, Jamar Chase, we also got Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith, who's been very underrated as well, Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, probably a few others that I'm forgetting, but like those are obviously the main ones that um, come to mind. And Elijah Moore kind of didn't have, at least for counting stats, didn't have those same stats because either he was injured a lot or he just wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't great to start a year. He wasn't bad necessarily, but he was just average but then he really turns it on during like the midway point in the year it when until he got injured he was one of the better receivers statistically wise in the national football league and i think really kind of going into uh into a, his year two when he's going to have a significantly better uh core around him uh with obviously how who the jets have drafted who they've signed who they're getting back from injury i think he could really be insanely dangerous given his obviously his kind of versatility he can play slot he can play outside his route running is amazing he's got great feet great uh good hands i think i think his hands they're not great but they're solid and i just think overall he should be a key cog in this um offense especially considering the chemistry really from day one he's had with zach wilson 
I have a conundrum with Elijah Moore, and it's nothing against him personally. I don't really have much against him. He he's looks to be a good receiver. His hands could do refining. His red zone ability can do refining. But other than that, I don't really think there's anything I can harp on to hate on him. But I just don't know where he's going to fit in the offense if Corey Davis is going to be a boundary and Garrett Wilson's going to be a boundary because they brought in three fantastic tight ends. And I just don't know where he fits. They're not going to be able to play uh, a slot. In a well, here's the ends. thing. But here's the thing. I'm just going to go us off really quickly. But again, we got to make these <laughs> a bit quicker. But um, I just think that really kind of the Jets are going to use a multitude of looks. I think that one and two is going to be Wilson and Moore. And then you're going to see a multiple looks where you're going to see one tight end sets, two tight end sets, two running back sets, maybe even running back in a fullback set. The amount of looks that the Jets can use with this kind of uh, personnel this year is dangerous. And I think Elijah Moore, though, he's going to be one of those guys who's going to be a fits all scheme because he is one of the most important players on this team. And I think he'll probably be ahead of Corey Davis. I think Garrett Wilson, I think by the end there, he won't because he is a great player. I'll talk about him in a bit, but I think the amount of looks the Jets can use, it's just going to be scary. I think they'll use three receiver low a lot. And I think he'll probably see the field most of the time. My problem with that, though, is I just don't see Elijah Morris being a great boundary wide receiver this season uh, or a he was, Z wide receiver. He, he, he was he, good. He was yeah, good, his but... one good game in garbage time against Indianapolis as a as a Z receiver or as an X receiver even. But I, I just don't think he's I don't think that's what he's suited for. I think as a slot receiver, he can build himself into a niche that he can become a top 10 at that spot in the league. And I think he can go into top five anyway. if he, if he works that out, but I just don't yeah. see, I don't see him as that boundary guy. I, we'll see just, how I, I think he was actually very good. Like you saw him against Byron Jones. He absolutely kind of cooked him in on the, outside. Oh, but, but that was in the slot. And then we're going to go to our third player on the offensive side of the ball. And that's going to be the left tackle, George Fant. Mm. I think, yeah, I think George Fant was, again, another player that, again, by a lot of NFL fans probably, I think, recognized, but not exactly really like, oh, is he really that even that good? He was actually one of the best left tackles in football last year, believe it or not. He was allowed the third least pressures out of all left tackles in the NFL. He was probably Wilson's most easily, his uh, most consistent blocker. He was very good in the run game as well he's only got one year left on his contract i think the jets are definitely looking to renew his deal given how successful he was on the left side and i think really i would based on he, his performance uh last year is probably one of the main reasons why i think they're looking the jets are looking to kind of move, move mckay beckton who was very very good in his rookie year kind of actually moving him to right tackle because of the fact that fent was so good as a left tackle last season i think if he can kind of just replicate how his play was last year again he's he's 30 he's 30 but that's not for a tackle that's not really that old offensive line when you see Trent Williams he's the best in the game he's 33 34 and I think Fant is still I would consider in his prime so I think this is a no-brainer in my opinion actually for Jets key players and if he kind of just um, keeps up his play with how much the Jets have really improved the offensive line I think this could be a very very dangerous unit. Yeah, I think you said it all. He's just an all-around solid blocker. He's the perfect guy to have on Zach's blind side. And I think that's pretty much all he needed and in terms of that the tackle positions. I think he said as long as Mekhi Becton isn't unbelievably fat. But uh, hey, he, he said it, not me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think Fant is... I think Fant is a really good player for them to have. And especially now with the running scheme that they're probably going to be able to go deeper into with Brees Hall and with Lake and Tomlinson, they're going to be able to run to that side a lot more, which is going to be a little bit more dangerous for defenders to come across. I think George Fant knocked the nail on the head. Great analysis yeah, of him. Thank you. <laughs> right. And then now we're going to go to the defensive side of the ball. And I am a lot less optimistic as Mr. Kadali for the defensive side of the ball, but I'm going to start with someone that I do like, and that's Quinn and Williams. You go first. Mm. Though. Yeah. Um, Quinn and Williams was again, another really underrated player. I think he was probably, he's not in that Aaron Donald convo, but I think he's, I think he's arguably in that, like um, probably he was, I mean, I think he's kind of, tier two tier three in terms of interior defensive linemen because they have obviously no one is in the Aaron Donald conversation and then you go into the second tier when you got guys like uh Jeffrey Simmons Cam Hayward and 
Quinn was, I think statistically, he was pretty close to those guys. I mean, but I think he, he's got the talent. I think he should jump into, I think he will jump into that category this year, but I think he's a bit off it, but I think he is easily tier three. And I think he is one of the, I think he's one of the better interior defensive linemen in the NFL. There's a reason why he was drafted third overall. And a lot of people like to label him as, oh, wasn't a great pick at third overall, but he's actually been a very solid contributor on a defensive line that has just been bereft of talent for so long. And that's really where I think he could really, why I think he could excel this year, considering the fact that for the first time he's going to have really what should be at least very good edge rushers. And I think um, just kind of, for the past few years, he's been very underrated. I think in um, year one with Salah, he was actually performing really well. He was was he was injured a bit. He was injured a little bit, but I think overall he had a quietly solid season. I think he is a. I think he's just not what I mean. It's not much to say. I think he's just a very solid um, interior defensive lineman. I think he could maybe make that jump to elite. I think he truly has that potential. All right, uh, I. I like Quentin Williams, and I think my problem with Quentin Williams, it's not a problem with Quentin Williams, it's a problem with the rest of the Jets team, is what I always bring up with him is th- I think he's the best player on your team. I think Quentin I think, Williams, I think as so. of now, yeah, ha- has would, been the best player on the Jets. I think and this so. is not not a dig on Quentin Williams at all. He's He could be a, a certainly can be a second team all pro or pro bowl player even first team i would argue i think he can he he's can got that be, potential he, he can be. he's there. not he hasn't been but yes as quinn and williams being the most accomplished player on your team says something doesn't it that, that's that's all i have to say yeah yeah no obviously i think the past he, few years i'm not i'm not going to try and argue on behalf of the last few years team because i think people try to do this you're just fighting a lost cause the team in the past few years um so under like solid year one with all the injuries like that team just it, they were feeling a bunch of um, journeymen and rookies. Like there was no one was going to stand out on that team and you can't defend it. It was clearly going to be a bad team from day one. I'm never going to defend the Gase Darnold days. Those were a mistake. And I think Quinton Williams, again, like I said, I agree with you. The fact that he was the best player on the team, even though I think he's very good, I think it is an indictment. But I think with the amount of players that are coming back from injury, the amount of rookies that I think could develop and the amount of new guys we've bought, built brought in through the draft and free agency could really change a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, definitely a culture change is very mm. important. I'm actually only going to bring up two players. You'll understand my third reasoning after we do, but the second player I'm going to bring up here is CJ Mosley. Mm. Someone I'm definitely not as high on. Uh, see, I, I think CJ Mosley, he is a very, very, very interesting prospect because of the fact that I think, when you think of CJ Mosley, a lot of people think that because he just, well, because I think he plays on the Jets, a lot of people think, oh, because he didn't put up like an all pro number like he did in Baltimore. Now he's washed. He actually had a very decent year. He was, I, again, I could be missing on this, but I believe he was fourth in tackles, um, fourth in tackles this year. He I was tied for Definitely it. not. I'm no, I think, that up right now. no, I think, I think, I, I'll check. I'll check. I'm I'll okay check. right now. That's what I, that's what I saw, but I I will definitely check. I can yes, he was he was fourth uh, in tackling. He was fourth uh, ahead of right. Roquan Smith. May I add? All right. I all mean, right. but that being said, I believe I'm gonna be honest. I'm not gonna be just a homer. I think tackling is just a a flawed stat. I think efficiency is very important. But the fact that a quote unquote washed C.J. Mosley was fourth in tackling and also was above average in coverage, I think says a lot that he isn't a washed player. There's still a lot there. I think. When I question the linebacking core, I don't really question CJ Mosley. I question the depth of the linebacking core, which again, maybe new additions, hint, hint, Quan Alexander could really help that. But I think CJ Mosley definitely, based on just his productiveness, I think he is definitely a key cog in the system. I know Robert Sala, the minute he got here, they weren't really sure on CJ Mosley immediately, they didn't know how well he fit the scheme. Obviously, going from a 3 4 in Baltimore, a blitz scheme to a 4 3, but he's really said how well he how good of a football player in general he is that he can adjust to that system really well. So yeah, I think CJ Mosley is definitely a key player. And I think he can, I think he's still not necessarily an elite uh, linebacker like he was in Baltimore, but I still think he's actually a very solid piece to this defense. CJ Mosley is a key player. And for you, it might be for the right reasons. For me, it's for the wrong reasons. And I don't think he's a particularly bad player. I'm not going to go ahead and say he has no talent left in him, but I think he has all the talent in the world that he always had. 
And I think he has all of the brains, which is the most important part, mm. which is what's going to play a very important part in this season for the linebacking core. But I think he's doing it on an overused mechanized body that can't run at full speed anymore. I he think can, no, he can run at full speed, but obviously not for the same amount of players. I think we're definitely going to see a lot more rotation. I think that's again, why we're really prioritizing kind of adding depth to this uh, linebacking core, which I think is. I, definitely I saw a clip the other day of CJ Mosley's change of direction in a game against the Colts, I believe. And he was trying to tackle, I believe it was Ashton Doolin on a, uh, I think it was a, I think it was a flip pass and Doolin did a little juke move and CJ Mosley just, he, I don't know what he was trying to do. And he just, it looked like he was 70. It was really fun, yeah. but yes, I, I but hope, that's, I'm try that's to bring one play. That's no, one. No, no, play. I, know, I, know. I, I have, I have more to argue in my behalf, but I, I was just bringing this up as an example. Even the game I watched in its entirety against the Dolphins, he didn't look like he can tackle Duke Johnson. Yeah, and I think the run defense was such a huge weakness, which, again, why the point where tackling is a flawed stat. But he, I think in just, coverage. I think was, C.J. Mosley being the head honcho in your linebacking room, is it's not a good look unless you bring in Quan Alexander. Which I think we bring in Quan Alexander. Reports that's a, are saying mm. he's tending towards New Orleans, I believe. But no, I've heard the opposite. I've heard he's they're still in contact and still very. But yeah. you, I mean, it's just it's all rumors. You never know. Yeah. But I think that he's definitely one of it's. They're definitely one of the far front runners still. Yeah, probably. But now you've got C.J. Mosley, Quincy Williams, and I believe Hamza Najraldine as your linebackers. That's yeah, and three. Jamie and Sherwood, Marcel Harris, and Delshawn Phillips is the other guys. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not it's a good not it's core. not a great linebacker. Core. That is the I acknowledge the weakness of this group. And my point of putting C.J. Mosley as a key player is. He needs to go back to 2018 C.J. Mosley no, Ravens. No, no, he does not. Or this linebacking core doesn't fix. That's that's where I'm saying no, it. No, that's not true at all. Because why do as, you say that? As, well, I the reason why I say that is easy. Because as much as you may harp on is that that the linebacking core is inexperienced. That's the point I'm going to use. What if the what if some of the guys that I think what if guys like Quincy Williams, who I think I'm really high on, I think he can actually take a huge leap in the system, become a not a great linebacker, but at least an average one. I think you could definitely do that. I, I really like him from last year. I think you got guys like Sherwood. Na- Sherwood was actually performing well before he tore his ACL. Nazrul Dean, who I think is solid as a will. And you got Delshawn Phillips as well. Marcel Hedders from the Niners. Not great options, but depth, they, they're serviceable. But I think depth options. You they're need depth to- op- and those, those are not the ones I'm using. I'm mainly using Sherwood and Nazrul Dean. But the point I'm trying to make is that, and Quincy Williams, obviously. But the point I'm trying to make is that it is completely inaccurate to say that this linebacking core will be awful if CJ Mosley isn't a 2018 version of him because that's just well, not that, going to happen. Yeah, I'm, I might have oversold it a little bit. I'm saying CJ Mosley needs to step it up from last oh, year. Oh, yeah, definitely. I hope I win. Or this I mean, linebacking core is going to be bad. Oh, linebacking core will be bad if he, I mean, unless like Quincy and unless we bring in Quan Alexander, then it's different. Yeah. But well, you yeah, don't have to. yeah, I know. I know. And now I'm, I'm just going to cut it off here. That's that's the end of the C.J. Mosley debacle. We're <laughs> going to go into the third defensive key. I'm not going to say player. And I'm going to let you monologue here. Robert Sala. I've Ooh. been waiting for a long time Ooh. to hear why you are so confident in this man as a defensive coach and as a coach in general. Please break it down for me. I'm not even going to interrupt at all. Okay. That, okay. Well, I wish you had warned me on this because I am – I definitely want to say this because Dylan and I, for the longest time, were kind of actually arguing really about the credibility of Robert Sala. And I think a lot of people like to say, oh, well, because he, he's not how, – how good of a defensive mind can he really be if he had the worst statistical defense? But I just think that is probably, in my opinion, one of the stupidest arguments ever. That, okay, because – and the reason why is because, I mean, frankly, I don't think any – any coordinator could have like kind of worked with this uh, defense and it's not an indictment on the players that are still here, but the amount of journeymen are just rookies that were in this system that we had to rely on to play significant minutes. It's not only the starters. It's not because of the starters that we were so bad. It's because of the depth, like at when Lawson went down, when um, uh, Jamie and, he already sure was, was not sure what not sure what jared davis from the lines yeah. when he went down when 
Blake Cashman was traded. Uh, no, not when Blake, when Blake Cashman was injured, which he always is injured. And when um, also uh, other edge pieces like um, other, other edge pieces, when, how am I forgetting his name? The other Lawson, Shaq Lawson also went down. <laughs> it's just, and you also had, I remember uh, the Jets had the most cap space on IR, which means our main investments were actually on the injured report. And most of those players were on the defense side of the ball. Not to mention he was relying on Bryce Hall and Brandon Eccles, who were second year players and rookies respectively. And in the secondary, you didn't have Joyner, who was also a player who literally they signed to a one-year deal, gets injured first play of the season. And the other safety was Marcus May, who also tore his Achilles midway through the year. So it's when you look at the personnel he had around him, but you look at all those injuries and not only does it make your starting lineup worse, it makes your bench just, you don't have depth anymore. So he was relying on guys like Ashton Davis, Jason Pinnock, Michael Carter, the second to play, not like Pinnock and Mark, Michael Carter, the second, but they were playing like the full game. They weren't getting rest. It was just those players consistently. And those were, and those guys were rookies. Like that was just so much of a toll that he had to put on them because they had no depth. And when you look at it, when the defense was actually even remotely healthy, and remember, this is they didn't have loss in their entire season, their main free agency acquisition. They allowed 19 against the Panthers. They allowed 25 against the Patriots. They allowed 26 against the Broncos, 24 against the Titans, and before and 27 against the Falcons, which again, it's not great numbers. I'm not trying to argue that, oh, it was great numbers but when you also take into account that the Jets defense was on the field basically the whole game because that was the stretch where Zach Wilson was throwing picks left and right it actually looks pretty decent and then the whole team gets injured then they get absolutely dominated by the Patriots and the Bengals and the Colts and the Bills and yeah 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 you get it you get the point but what I'm trying to say is that in the early stretch when his team at least had some depth some semblance of a defense the team actually looked good I was watching those full fourth first four games and i can tell you that that defense was the reason why we were in all four of those games and then eventually eventually there's just so so much you can work with like he had nothing there and again thank you for letting me monologue but i'm not trying to i'm not trying to say that he like was perfect like he was a rookie head coach he was he made mistakes but i think to say oh uh a, a super bowl winning um best defensive coordinator, uh, top defensive coordinator in the league, that kind of mind who's been around the NFL for 15 years is all of a sudden just not a good head coach because he didn't work miracles with just a, a group that just couldn't that just like put too much strain on its players. It just doesn't make sense to say, oh, that's why Robert Sala isn't a good defensive mind. I think I have full confidence in him going into year two with a revitalized group. And I, you just argued as for why you should, but uh... – and you answered my first question, which was, why do you have faith in Robert Sala going forward? But my second question was, why do you think that he is good? It's why not that think- why, why, you gave the excuse. No, as, I, no my, the reason the, why the, I think he's no, the reason why I think he's good is because he made the 49ers defense one of the best in the league. He was a defensive coordinator, not a defensive assistant, I believe, with the Jaguars during Saxville. I believe I'm not 100% sure, I but I think he, he was, was in that coaching staff. He was yes. in that coaching staff. He was in the coaching staff with during the Legion of Boom, where he won a Super Bowl there. He is an accomplished mind. He's still relatively young, and he is a player's coach. You hear numerous players say how much they love playing for the guy. You saw a lot of the Jets players who were hyped to get him and are still really backing him up. So I think. That's to answer your second question. That's why I think he's good. Yeah, that's a good reasoning. I wasn't high on Sal at all. Even when they hired him, I was thinking they need someone that has an offensive mind. The well, last offensive people. mind we got was Adam Gase. I'm yeah, same brother. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> mutual suffering. Yeah, but uh, Mike Mike, Mike McDaniel season. But <laughs> where I I was thinking you need a an offensive mind for what's down to be a rookie quarterback. You went and got one of the best defensive minds out there. And while it didn't pay off in the first season, it, it surely will pay dividends this season. I am relatively high on Robert Sala going into the end of this season. Mm. But we are done with key players. We're going to go in a little bit of a swifter motion now until the draft where I'm going to let you monologue a bit more because you loved that. Yes. But uh, we're going to just break down key players. I'm just going to give you two points. You give me two points. I'll give you a player, say what you like, say what you're worried about, and then we move on. Nothing we'll worry about. Not worried Nothing about you're anything. worried about, about any of them. I'm just, right. I'm just kidding. 
first key player, and I, I didn't even have him on the list that we were doing, but I'm going to change that right now because he didn't play a snap last season, and he was your biggest addition last season. Hmm. Carl Lawson, Carl Lawson. He, he, he counts as a key addition. Well, I think the concern is easy, the Achilles injury. We don't know. I think with kind of the – um obviously the Achilles injury, that's one of the most devastating injuries a player can have. But as you've been seeing with recent medicine – people have been able to fully recover from Achilles injury. We saw Cam Akers kind of come back five months from an Achilles injury, which is just unprecedented. So I think obviously though, that isn't the norm, but I think maybe recovering fully from it is. So we have to see, but obviously that is the main concern. But also what I'm hearing is that really what I've been really floored with is how positive he's been taking it. Even the day he got injured, he's like, I'm going to be back better than I ever have. I'm going to keep working and keep working. And you hear all the players talk about, yeah, he's just an animal. He's just, he's built like an action figure. He's still like maintained amazing shape, even during the rehab process, which is amazing, obviously to hear when other guys, like uh, other guys just haven't maintained that same kind of mental toughness. So I'm, I think that's really exciting. I think he was just, obviously we considered him to be a hidden gem really in, um, Cincinnati when he was put he had his best year before he left for the Jets and was really putting up pressure numbers that really could have equated to even more sacks which is why we were so excited about him before again he did tear his Achilles but I think really kind of again being in that solid system which I think sorts sorry suits him perfectly I think he should definitely I mean hopefully again if he does fully recover which I think he will based on what I've been hearing I think he should be a great uh great piece of this defense yeah, I'm not going to really argue much against that. I mean, the Achilles is definitely the real problem yeah. for uh, Carl Lawson. I don't really see much of another problem other than maybe learning the defensive scheme because I don't think since I think it was played, very – it was actually – well, yeah, yeah, true, true. That's true. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure he was in the locker room and learning it, so I'm not really – I'm not concerned about that too much. And then you hit a nail on the head again. His recovery process could also be what makes him – another different player because we've seen players come back from injury that are better than they were before. And I'm not going to really use Cam Akers as an example because the five month recovery is for a running back. Carl Lawson has a lot more weight on him than Cam Akers does. And that's a lot harder to come back for, for someone who's going to need to change direction as much as he is. But I think what we're going to see from Carl Lawson is we're going to see him refine his game because he can't go into tackle. He, he can't go into offensive tackles, just running full speed ahead anymore with that Achilles. He's going to refine his game. And I think it's going to be better for him mm. moving into the next one. And we're going to bring in two tight ends for the price of one Conklin and Uzama. Ooh. Yep. I think this is a, another very interesting. It's another very interesting uh, topic because I think, um, I think really kind of, again, this, um, sorry, I was just stalling for a sec, but I think really this tight end group, another huge weakness that I didn't even talk about, because we talked about all the rece- the lack of receivers that he had. The tight end group was probably one of the worst in the national football. He had what Ryan Griffin, who is based of Ty- Tyler Croft and Ryan Griffin who were basically almost always injured. And then Kenny Yaboa, who I like Kenny Yaboa. I actually do like him, but let's be honest, he isn't a tight end one, but the tight end group just wasn't, it just wasn't good. It was, and that is another really underrated part that I think a rookie quarterback likes a big weapon that they can just kind of trust to go get the ball can, when during a situation when they're under duress, when they don't really understand the look. I think they'll always look to their tight end. I think that's a great, a valuable piece to have. And now for, again, for Zach Wilson, I have not only one, two, maybe even three of those guys when we talk about the draft. I think especially with Conklin and Uzama, I think they're uh, very great pieces. I think I could pull up their exact stats. They're not necessarily eye-popping. They, I, I wouldn't categorize them as that because Uzama, he uh, had, what, uh, 493 total yards last year, uh, which was actually a career year, funny enough. But the context also is that he was um, playing on the best receiving court in football. He had Jamar Chase, uh, T Higgins, Tyler Boyd, all to compete for targets and was still a great red zone threat when a lot of people, a lot of like you acknowledge that red zone, uh, red zone efficiency was one of um, the Jets problems. The guys like um, Elijah Moore weren't, it, it wasn't a point of strength. And I think Uzama can really help that Conklin, another guy, a guy that's really been impressing in um, mini camp and OTAs, what I've heard 
He also has another great piece, another piece that was kind of, again, also competing for targets with guys like um, Adam Thielen and obviously Justin Jefferson. And even you can say KJ Osborne was a solid Dalvin piece. Cook. Dalvin Cook, obviously, out of the backfield. And he also, decent statistics, 593 yards, also three touchdowns. So none of those guys were necessarily, they weren't great, but I think they were – uh, above average, I would say above average tight ends. And I think to get two of those guys and to get um, Jeremy Ruckert in the draft definitely makes it from a bottom five tight end group to an above average tight end group, which I think, again, for a young quarterback is so important. So I think both of those guys, I love that addition. Not, again, don't expect them to be Kelsey, Kittle, even Andrews or Waller. Uh, but I think they should definitely be huge upgrades from what we had last year. Yeah, uh, I'm going to break down strength and weakness. I'm going to break them down together because they oh, one more as... thing. They are huge. They're great blockers as well. Sorry. Yeah, I just that, 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 that was going to be my, that was going to be my strength for them. They're very important in the blocking scheme. I think CJ Uzama was the most valuable blocker for Joe Mix, mm. Joe Mixon last season. Huge. And I think that's going to, with Brees Hall being pretty much my Joe Mixon clone for this year. I think that's going to be massive for I him think as a rookie. Also, and for Tyler Conklin, I'm sorry, I just want to interrupt because yeah, I think course, this is course. so cool. Literally, one of the more underrated parts of a tight end um, that people really don't realize that they do sometimes is that tight ends actually sometimes help in pass protection. And Conklin is funny enough. Actually, I saw one play where he was literally holding off Nick Bosa one on one in yeah, a block. That. I think I showed that to you because yeah. to prove that he was a great blocker. And I think just the fact that he can do that to a an all pro edge rusher is just that is scary. So I think both that's a huge upside that you're getting with them. But yeah, continue on. Yeah, that, that's my benefit for them. Uh, Conklin and pass pro and in run blocking, I think he was very good last year. And uh, specifically, Uzama and run blocking was very crucial to the Bengals last season. Part of the reason that Joe Mixon was as good as he was. My my concern for the two of them is I just don't know how often they're going to be on the field together. And that's that's where the strength and weakness come together. Because we saw last year, Conklin was the tight end. He, there was usually one tight end on the field for Minnesota. There were times where they had Herndon, and there were times where they had Irv Smith. But uh, no, there Irv weren't. Smith out for Irv, the Irv whole Smith season. was out all year. It was pretty much Conklin on his own. So that's not where I see the problem. But the problem was Uzama, because when they had – two tight ends on the field, it was pretty clear that him and Sample were going to be blocking and Mixon was going to be running. When he was on the field by himself, the Bengals were throwing. And not to say that Zach Taylor and Michael Fleur are going to run the same exact offense, but they're from the same tree. And usually the personnel correlates with the play call. Mm. So I'm not... No, I, I, I disagree. I think, yeah. Uh, no, you finish it. Sorry. I just think CJ Uzama being on the field on his own means it's going to be a throw and Jeremy Ruckard plays into this as well. I'm, I just think personnel with the amount of players they have shockingly enough, the jets have a multitude of okay options that can confuse defenses. Mm -hmm. But I think if defenses can pick up when Uzama's on the field, when Conklin's on the field, when all three of them are on the field, it's not going to be as confusing as one might think. Mm -hmm. See, I see, I see your point, but I, I disagree with the fact that they're going to use the, I mean, I know you're not saying they're going to use the exact same, but I know Zach Taylor and um, Mike Floor they aren't for the same tree, but they're from similar trees. So I know what you mean, but um, I think the difference is, is that the Bengals love to use a gun. They love to use, because a lot of places where Uzama was on his own, he was in the slot or because the Bengals were running like um, a spread offense. Cause Burrow loved to use that. Cause he used it a lot at LSU and they, the Bengals knew they had guys that were just, lightning quick like chase and they knew they had guys who could just go get it one-on-one -on -one like higgins so they love to use spread and i think that was mainly the main reason why they use that and that's not really what the niners do that's not really what lafleur would really do and obviously the jets as much as i like their weapons they aren't jamar chase t higgins and tyler boyd so i think we're gonna see different looks and i think in two tight end sets the jets can definitely and i think definitely will throw the ball i think we'll see a lot of times where they'll use kind of they'll use two tight ends and uh, Wilson under center, and they'll use it to kind of disguise whether or not they're running or they're passing. And I think it will be very dangerous because oftentimes when you have two tight ends on the field, you think, Oh, they'll definitely run because the other tight end isn't going to, is going to be a blocking specialist. But the difference with us is that we have both the tight ends can catch the ball actually pretty well, which is, I think both of them were top 10 in lead in drop percentage. At least they had like the least amount of drops. So I think that's another great, uh, 
a uh, kind of great thing about the, this duo, but yeah, that's what, that's all I'm going to say. Yep. We both made that way too long. It's supposed to be just quick. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to, we're going to try again here. Jordan Whitehead, one good, one bad. Yeah. Uh, Whitehead, I think another one that I think is a very interesting piece. Um, the, uh, uh, the great thing about him is he is one of the best run defending safeties in the league. I think that is a clear point. If you've watched his film in Tampa, he was an absolute um, menace in the run game. He was a great guy to use in the box. Also underrated coverage. He isn't, he, a lot of people like to say that, Oh, he was below average coverage. He was actually a, he, he was solid in coverage. He wasn't bad, but obviously the weakness, I mean, he was average in coverage. I think that that's what I'd say. And that's why I'd say that he wasn't like, that's, I guess that's the weakness. Cause again, you're, he's a safety, so he's going to be in coverage and he wasn't great, but he wasn't bad either. I think it's embellished, but I think having an average safety as a weakness, isn't that average coverage safety isn't a weakness. And I think he's a well above average run defender. And again, run defense was the main weakness of this team. So I think if that's the trade-off, I'm fine with that, but I think he is a, another huge addition to this defense. He's a massive addition to this defense. I've mm. over time watching the film, I've grown into a, a Jordan Whitehead truther. I think he is one of the best run defending safeties in the league. I think yeah, he, I think that's indisputable. To, if you watch them, it's yeah. Yes. Go ahead. His mind and where he finds where the running back is going. He, he pretty much knows right when the snap is called where he needs to be. And he's there. And that's and, the exact thing we've been needing all like basically yeah. last year. My concern is having LaMarcus Joyner next to him instead of Antoine Winfield in the safety. Yes, course. I understand. That is, that is terrifying in terms of just the drop off in the talent. And I well, know it's not like Joyner you're saying, oh, no, I'm not, I'm no, I'm not saying that LaMarcus Joyner is Antoine Winfield or even, I mean, I mean, he's obviously not Antoine Winfield, but they're making it seem like Jamar, Lamar, Jamarcus Joyner, <laughs> LaMarcus Joyner is a, below average safety when i think i, I mean am. i that's exactly what i mean <laughs> i mean before he got injured though he wasn't i mean sure he was i mean he was wasn't i mean he he wasn't great at the start of his raiders uh he was, he on the was raiders no, like no, no 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 i'll save you the trouble he was bad for the raiders for the rams he, he was good he was bad for the raiders three years ago. but yes that, that was three years ago, ago. But also, he was, it was he, it was I'm with sorry. the raiders and it was a different scheme so i'm just saying that yeah but it's been three years since we saw him play good, productive football. I don't think he is a good But safety. then again, one of those years, he was out the entire year. So it's not like he played two bad years. He played, played two bad years. He played one year of bad football with the But Rangers. he hasn't played good football in three years. That's, but that's he what hasn't, I'm trying to say. But he hadn't played football in a year. So I think it's like when you say he hasn't played football in, uh, good football in three years, it makes it sound like he had two bad years. But he had one bad year, one injured year, which is a pictorial injury, which shouldn't like – it's not like he'll hurt his like straight line speed or anything I'm, like that. I'm not but... sold on him. I'm not sold on him, especially because Jordan Whitehead is he's not particularly fast. Like he's yeah, yeah. No, I see, you, I see. It's just like over the top concerns. For I me. see. Like, but I think also another great thing about it is if Lamar Joyner isn't good, I think he'll be okay. I think he'll be fine. He won't be great, but he'll be fine. And then if you don't get him, you've got great uh ex- young players with potential like Pinnock and ashton davis who i think aren't necessarily great pieces but they're pieces that can potentially break out and you're talking about speed that's your concern jordan pinnock is a converted slot into a safety and i think speed definitely wouldn't be as much a concern so i think another reason why i think a lot of people like him maybe who knows maybe he could be the free safety this year i think a lot of people he actually was uh graded pretty well by pff towards the end of the year i know a lot of people don't like pff i'm not even a big fan of it but if you take that into account I'm, i'm just saying but Anyway, that's the right. point I'm trying uh, to make, but obviously it's a yeah. last key addition. This one is probably the biggest key addition, and that is Surridge proclaimed top 10 cornerback in the league, DJ. Reed. I didn't say he was a top 10 <laughs> cornerback. I said statistically wise. We're going to keep this one brief, all right? This one brief. is going to be brief, and I think we actually agree on it. I remember we are talking about it. We actually agree on it. I think G- DJ Reed is a slept on cornerback, and I think he's a very good cornerback. He isn't a top 10 cornerback, even if the stats say so. I mean, if he, I think if he puts it up again, I think it's, you can actually make an argument because that's two years in a row and he's young. But I think in the system, which is very similar to Seattle, he's going to be running cover three as a left cornerback. He didn't give up a single touchdown. And you can say, oh, 
well, was he covering? I think he was actually he was he was the CB one in Seattle. I mean, maybe it was Sidney Jones for the majority the of the Sydney year. Sidney Jones, yeah, I don't know, but I mean, I mean, they were both guarding ones because he's playing primarily on the left, which is what he's going to be playing. But from the left cornerback spot, he didn't give up a single touchdown, and he was guarding either a boundary one or a boundary two. I think that has to take be taken into account definitely, considering how how much he held up the uh, receivers that he was facing weakness i think it's easy you can say that he's five nine and he's a boundary corner which obviously is a concern but the fact that it hasn't hampered him yet and he is going to be in the same system makes me think that it won't be much of an issue especially considering he's literally going into the exact same situation yeah uh i'm going to say you hit the nail on the head yet again with the concern and the strength i just want to add on one thing we're going to see the epitome of Ahmad Gardner, which is he got that dog in him and the epitome <laughs> of the guy who has the advanced stats that no one knows on the other exactly. side. Of DJ Reed. Exactly. It's, it's, gonna it's be the very perfect compliment. It's the, <laughs> it, it, exactly. it really is. <laughs> Moving into the draft. And speaking of, oh, he speaking got that dog in him. Let's sauce. talk Ahmad Gardner. Sauce Gardner, fourth overall pick in the draft. We're going to go into our draft segment. What do you got? Well, I think, I mean, He's obviously the headliner. He was the fourth overall pick. But one of the weird things that I'm seeing now, and it really didn't start until he go, went to the Jets, is now that apparently Sauce is overrated because he played no competition, which I just find hilarious. Because not because not because it isn't – I mean, I went, I don't think it's really that big of a deal because he also locked up Jameson Williams in the Yeah, that's where playoff. I was going to go with that's it. That's what I was going to say. That's why I don't think it's a concern. But what I find funny is not that it's a concern. It's that it wasn't even the concern until he went to the Jets which I just think is funny. That's all I'm well, saying. I think That's that would have been I'm the concern saying. no matter where no, he was drafted. No, well, I think I'm just seeing it a lot that, oh, because he's not going to be able to guard NFL receivers because he played against AAC comp, American-level competition, which I think when you lock up Jamison Williams and when and still allow also no touchdowns from his cornerback spot, which is perfectly enough opposite to G.J. Reed's um, opposite spot, I think he should be – I think I, – I think he should be great. I think – um, obviously going to be pay- playing tougher level competition. But one of the things I'm hearing about him is that he's also one of those guys who just doesn't make, make mistakes twice. He makes, if he makes a mistake, he'll, he's a great learner. He'll learn from it. He won't make the mistake a second time. And I think being obviously a lot of guys are gifted with great and athletic talent. So not sauce level when you're six, three, and just as long as he is, but still great yeah. talent. But if you're willing to learn, from uh if you're willing to learn and willing to kind of air great learn and you don't make mistakes then uh i think okay I don't know, bro, come on man come on. <laughs> keep going keep going come on but uh, you know what i mean but yeah i think he should i think with the physical tools he has all the tools to be a top five corner i don't he's not obviously i think a lot of people are anointing him some, some people are saying oh he's overrated which i think is just funny that they say it after he's drafted to the jets and then some others are saying oh he'll be immediate immediate lockdown top five corner which i think also is um also is definitely premeditated but i think it's almost inarguable that he definitely has the tools to be a top five corner in this league yeah i think sauce gardner I, I, if you guys remember the draft live stream i said the jets are going to take sauce here i remember and- i wasn't i was i was convinced they were going to take someone else but I'm happy with it. I think. It was yeah. A great pick. Uh, and I like the pick. I like the player. I hate that he's going to be going against the Dolphins twice a year, but uh, I'm not, I'm just going to go again. We're going to keep the same format strength and weakness going forward with the draft. You can talk a little bit more about Brees Hall. Cause I haven't heard you talk about him a lot. Mm. I kind of, I kind of want to hear that, but uh, strength for Ahmad Gardner. He got that dog in him. Uh, exactly. And, he's he's i mean i don't know how else to describe it he, he's him like he's him he's just him like you he gave up zero touchdowns he put the number one wide receiver on my board to negative on an two yards and he, he's he was just amazing there there was mm-hmm. no competition for him in college this season that he couldn't absolutely lock down. And I don't think that that type of consistency, no matter who he was playing, goes away. My negative for him is I think that there's going to be a lot of pass interference calls on him early. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's, 
I think that's that going to be the, the one, one thing only that thing I, I can doubt. think of. I agree. I think I, I'm going to start this next session, and, and that's Garrett Wilson, who yeah. I am significantly lower on. Yes, I remember his, that. His positive is he has hands that catch the ball. They they don't drive I them. Just, I magnets. just see that Clemson game in the They're playoff. magnets. They're yep. magnets. And it's beautiful to watch the ball stick to his hands. My negative. My all negative. Right, all right. All right. Um, all right. Is, we're, so, we're like five. Yep. Yeah, uh, my negative is route running. His route running is so odd. And <laughs> while it might throw off a college football level corner, I feel like with the, the smarts the defensive coordinators have, they're going to just say, if if Garrett Wilson's running with the weird lanky thing that he does, just blow him up. He's going to get hurt. And it might happen. And uh, I know that sounds bounty-like, and it kind of is. <laughs> but the way he runs, I kind of feel like if he gets hit in the wrong spot, he can go down. Uh, and, it's... And, then, and then another weakness, I know I said one, I'm going to go with two. He was the third string wide receiver for the Ohio State Buckeyes last year. He, he was taken ahead of Olave. I don't think anyone can argue against Jackson Smith and the Jigba as their wide receiver one last year. Yeah. I think Garrett Wilson was not targeted enough to go into an NFL offense and be the one right away. That's that's mm. the so my def is is uh route running definitely unorthodox. But funny enough, they put it as a uh, weakness. I'd actually put it as a strength. And that's the thing that's so funny. One of the funniest things about him is that his route running is so polarizing because as obviously as kind of disjointed and awkward as it it may look, it also actually did throw off like not only just like um, average like D3 level uh, corners. it, It kind of confused the best of the best. And at the same time, he also possesses agility and just kind of speed out of his routes that make him so guard, hard to cover, even though, again, he his route running is unique. And one of the guys that he compared himself to was, who also ran really unorthodox, you might not know the name, Stevie Johnson of the Buffalo Bills, yeah, I know. who kind of ran like that. And he had multiple thousand yard seasons. And I think, obviously, I think that kind of shows that even if you have an unorthodox level of route running you can still be a very productive very good receiver in at the nfl level and he isn't necessarily um i don't think he obviously it's the first receiver no second receiver taken uh first on my board i don't think he'll be take be the level of other guys that broke out like justin jefferson or jamar chase but it wouldn't surprise me if he goes for a thousand yards year one because i think that route that kind of route running that kind of like speed and agility and hands is like the perfect combination for the NFL. I think his route running is, I, th- I don't know if they're going to completely refine it. Cause I think that's one of the things that make him unique and hard to cover, but they'll obviously, I think they'll obviously kind of make him be a bit more technical with his routes. And there's a reason why he's one of the highest floor receivers in this class. But I think obviously it's a very polarizing subject, but I think he'll be good. We're going to go on to the defensive end of the class that I hated. Oh yeah, this I is. Had a, do you still I had hate a, him? Because we haven't talked about him in a minute. I don't. I, I haven't seen anything to change my mind other than he <laughs> fell to where I think he should have been or lower. But uh, the hatred, the, pa- the, the, passion, the hatred, the is passionate still, hatred I had for the, the prospect hatred of Jermaine Johnson, not still, for the men, not for the men. I know nothing about. I him remember you were just celebrating when he was falling, like you couldn't stop smiling. It yeah. Was, I, I, I was praying on his, on downfall. his downfall, not as a man, <laughs> as a prospect. I did not like him as a prospect. Don't take it as if I just didn't like him. <laughs> just hate Jermaine Johnson. Yeah, it was, there was Jermaine Johnson, a positive and a negative. You go first. I need to try to figure out. You, you got it. You got to say, you got to only say one negative. Right? Yeah, I will. One okay. negative, one positive, and you got to do the same. <laughs> okay, well, positive. I think really he was – one of the most productive edge rushers in college football, 11 half sacks in 12 games. He's got ideal size, speed, length for this, uh, this scheme. And he was productive. He's everyone says, Oh, he's old. He's only 23. Like, come on. That's not, that's not really a concern. That's valid. And I think a lot of people will say, Oh, well, he didn't really improve until his last year, but I think that's a positive. I think that actually shows growth. He was getting better. He's another one of those guys that was very coachable, has a high motor, uh has uh, his moves are his moves are decent i think as well but i think overall when you're a when you have that 
when you have ideal measurables and you're productive, I think, and you're also one of the better run defenders at edge rusher. He's one of those edge rushers who just doesn't, he doesn't give up if it's a run play. He'll also do a great job of setting the edge at, at that position. But I think when you're one of those, um, when it, when you can combine those physical traits with production, I think that makes you, in my opinion, a top, uh, a top prospect in any draft class. And I think Jermaine Johnson kind of, I don't, I don't really know why he fell, but I, I'm so glad he did. I think this is a great uh, situation that he's going, getting himself into. I'm, I'm not going to argue with you, the Jermaine Johnson thing, unless you say something that truly. You took my positive from me, which is the production. Mm-hmm. And I thought of an amazing analogy that I'm going to use for a different player. So I'm, I'm going to let that this one slide because I think it would lead to like a 16 hour segment. Yes. But uh, I just don't see it with Jermaine Johnson. He, he's like a big guy who had a good combine, who had good statistics, which is pretty much all you need to go in the first round. And but speed. just like, and like, yeah, that's and the ideal, combine. ideal, basically I, ideal measurables and production, which is the main thing you can ask. He about. had a third. And, and he interviewed well. And he, yeah, yeah. And he, he had a third of what most pass rushers have in their arsenal in terms of pass rush moves. I didn't think he could be less interesting of a prospect than he was. Just the way he played, watching his tape, the sacks he had were based off of other guys pressured. The quarterback would run into him and he'd knock him down. I watched, I think, three full games of him trying to understand what is making people put him this high. And it, it just never hit me. And eventually I said, you know what, maybe it's just the baseline. It's, and th- that's what I think it ended up being, which is why I think he fell. But watching him, he, he, he kind of just ran. He didn't do anything that was that interesting in terms of feints, in terms of moves. He, he just ran and hoped, and it, it worked out for him. His bull rush was okay. He had he had pretty much nothing else. That, that that's my negative. I'm not going to. Bull rush was very good. I mean, like no, no, it wasn't that good though. It didn't. He he didn't consistently. I mean, if you get an 11 half sacks from just a bull rush, then. But that wasn't just what he was doing. There were quarterbacks that were scrambling, and I think most of the sacks were quarterbacks just like running for dear life, and him like clipping. So, their legs. so 11 and a half sacks just happened because the quarterback happens to just make a mistake. Uh, obviously, not, but from that. the games I, from the games I watched and from the sacks I watched. A lot of them came from just weird plays, like him clipping legs, him pushing defenders into the quarterback. Like, well, that's weird. that's again, that's a bull rush. I mean, yeah, yeah. but uh, well, I just don't I think, see a lot. Well, of the, when like, I when I see that, when you see that, maybe you say, "Oh, well, his moves just aren't very refined." I'm like, "That's okay. That's fine. That's what coaching is for." And that's another reason why I think yeah. when you have those measurables and already those production, all you need to do is kind of refine that. I think that's definitely something that you can do. But yeah, yeah glass anyway. half full, glass half empty type of fair mentality enough, fair here. Enough. We're going to the last player. I know I said we were going to talk about Ruckert. We unfortunately do not have time if we, we want to get to the not have time. Segment. We're going to talk Brees Hall. We're going to keep it short. I'm not going to talk. You go. Yeah, uh, Brees Hall. I think another one of the picks that originally I was like, oh, I wanted a Kobe Dean. But well, I wasn't actually upset about it, but I was surprised because a running back when we already have Michael Carter. But the more I have thought about this pick, the more I absolutely love this pick. Because originally, I wasn't, funny enough, I wasn't really that focused on the running backs. I mean, I thought, oh, Kenneth Walker, I watched him a few games. I thought he was running back one. But when you look at Brees Hall's production, it is insane. He had 1,572 yards, 5.6 yards per carry, 21 touchdowns in his sophomore year. He had... Uh, 140, uh, 1,472 yards, 5.8 yards per carry, and 20 touchdowns in, oh no, that was 2021, the previous year is 2020, and that was as a junior. So he was putting up incredible numbers, but he wasn't being noticed because he's at Iowa State. So he was putting up elite, elite numbers for running back. And when you watch his tape, it's just, it's mesmerizing. He looks, he, his patient, like, he's a big guy. He's a big guy. He's got, but he's a big guy and he still has really good speed. Like four, I think it's sub four, four, I believe. I think it's like four, three, nine. He was, I think he was like four, four, one, but like in that, I don't know. It was in that range, which is insane for a guy that he, how big he is. He's, uh, he's a big guy, but he's still in, he's still really fast. Also really good catching out of the backfield. He's, um, in terms of kind of agility, that's another one of his huge strengths. He come by his come combination of patience and agility is just insane like some of the spin moves that he just like pulled off against teams i know it's big 12 defenses which obviously have this agenda that they're not very good but it's still a d1 defense and he's doing and the moves that he just pulled off it's just 
it makes me think somehow like how did this guy not go in round one but then when you consider that obviously the market for running backs and the positional value of running backs have changed like it makes sense but the jets have gotten a home run hitter and out of all the guys funny enough it's a second rounder who i think has the least potential of busting like if Brees hall doesn't become a great nfl player not a great if he doesn't become at least a solid nfl level player he i would be surprised because i think he's got everything he's got the measurables he's got the size he's got the production he's got just the love of the game i think because that's where the jets prioritize and draft picks so i think really <laughs> out of flight moment <laughs> exactly exactly flight moment but uh i think really no way i would be unless injuries please don't get injured please but i i would be stunned if he's not a, at least a solid nfl running back yeah i don't really see any fail for Brees hall i think it's exactly. pretty much i i'm trying to think of one i heard this. yeah i think maybe he's a bit below average in pass blocking that's the one thing i heard that maybe but it's fine okay it's I'll, fine. I'll, i can live with that like it's fine. But, yeah, you, you got a home run there. Going into our final segment of the episode, if you stuck around with us, you are amazing, or you're mm. a really, really big Jets fan, or both. Who knows? Uh, there are very few, very, very good Jets fans. <laughs> um, you nah, want to give your record prediction? Fans. You want to give your record prediction? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to be somewhat optimistic. I'm going to say, and which is like kind of a weird thing to say about the Jets, but I really like this team. I'm going to say seven and 10, which again, sounds sad to say optimistic, but I think given like Dylan said, how hard you didn't say this yet, but we've been talking about it. This schedule is so hard. This is such a difficult schedule that it's just going to be so difficult to get around. But when I look at the games that we play as good as every, as most teams are, we actually can match most of the teams because we don't have necessarily elite, a lot of elite players, at least at least least yet we don't have that many elite players but we've got a bunch of guys that are just at least average or above average in every position the only position that i would knock as a weakness is linebacker i think the rest of the team just as a whole is built just so solidly just like every no position is necessarily outmatched against many of the teams that i play the only teams that games that i think are just i feel like just so hard to win that i just wouldn't count on the team to win is buffalo away I think that's just almost an unwinnable game and probably I'd say for some reason, I just think Denver away is just never, never a good matchup. I I hate that. I hate playing Denver away. And with Russ, I think that's almost unwinnable. But other than that, I think I'm not saying we're going to go 15 and two, but I'm saying every team we can at least say, well, we have this, so we have a fighting chance and we have guys that are young and exciting. So I feel that the, what I think about it, when I look at the games, I think a lot of difficult matches, but very few that I would say, no way we win this, which is yeah. why I'd say seven and 10. I'm going to two down you. I was going to say six and 11, but now that I think about it, you never beat the Patriots and I'm not going to give you the satisfaction. See, here's there. the thing. Here's the thing. What I'm going to say, you probably have us losing to like all the great teams and we probably, no, 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 we'll get sweeped by the Patriots, but we will win the games that you just don't expect us to win. No, like, I have we'll you, somehow I have you... beat the bills at home. I, I have you beating the Patriots, uh, not the Patriots, the Packers. That was the one that I had you beating the Packers when I did this whole thing. I'm not going to go through every game I had, <laughs> but I think you guys, I'm just going to say the Jets. I'm not going to go with you guys every time. Um, the Jets, they have pretty much a roster that is built to work this year and succeed next year. And I think they're going to do that through losing and they'll take their wins where they can Injuries could make this a five and 12 team injury can make this a three and th- uh, 14 team. And if they stay healthy, this team could go nine and eight. There's not uh, I don't think there's a very good shot of them winning nine games, but it's a possibility. I'm going to go with five and 12 though, because I'm not sold on Zach Wilson. I'm not sold on Robert Sala and they need more time to work it out. I know they have the whole off season and training camp, but given the hard schedule they have, no matter how well they built the trenches, the composition of the roster, those are the two most important pieces to the team. And they just haven't quite found it yet. And I don't think they're going to by the start of the season. That is my reasoning. But I think that is all for the video. I really appreciate all of you guys. We are going to be posting a lot of these clicks, clips on TikTok, Instagram. Hopefully if you guys are here watching the YouTube video, that means we did pretty well on the YouTube video. So uh, <laughs> appreciate everything that you guys have done for us. 
road to 2k very very slow road to 2k but we're gonna we're gonna take it where we can get it we're gonna have some podcast episodes more bust or boom we're gonna try to get to every team and uh we hope to see you guys in the next one thank you